Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I'm your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. And hello. with us today, hello, Malcolm, and with us today is Matt Ramsey. It's a guest episode. Hello, Matt. Hey, How everybody. You? I'm doing great. Hello. Thank you guys for having me. Hey, our pleasure. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for taking the time. Matt is a vocal coach, a voice teacher, if you will, and we're going to talk about how to improve your vocal technique, warm-up exercises you can do before you hit the studio, before you go into a recording session. And we're going to talk about the importance, like the overall importance of like taking vocal, vocal lessons or improving your technique because there's, I mean, I'm no expert, Matt is going to tell us about this, but I assume there are multiple like benefits to this. It's You're not going to hurt yourself, you're going to sound better. There's a lot of benefits to uh, training your voice, learning proper technique. And we're going to ask Matt a ton of questions about this today. And we're so stoked to have him on. So, well, Matt, um, maybe start by telling us a little bit about yourself and maybe describing what exactly is it that you do. So I'm like 22 years old, graduate college, and I studied advertising in school because I really, really wanted to find a way to kind of marry my creative side with my business side. And so my first internship right out of college brings me to San Francisco. And what happened was I had the worst three months of my entire life. I mean, this internship was horrible. I was like working like crazy hours, you know, just writing tons and tons and tons of copy that I would never own. It would always eventually be for somewhere else. And so at the end of that three months, my boss has this conversation with me and he's like, hey, Matt you know, you seem like a really great guy and you seem like you like to talk a lot about, about this creative stuff, but I didn't really see you do a whole lot of anything. <laughs> and he's like, I think you should probably investigate why that is. And so I was very decidedly not hired at this, at this advertising agency after my, my internship. So I have this period of of unemployment, but also a lot of self kind of exploration and reflection. Right. And my whole life, I've been playing music. I've been playing music since, you know, I've been playing guitar since I was 11 years old. I had been in screamo bands in high school and stuff like that. Not, a, not really any real vocal technique or anything like that to speak of. And so for the first time, I'm kind of like, well, if, you know, getting, you know, not hired at this advertising job is, <laughs> is the worst thing that's going to happen to me because I felt really bad. I was like, well, what could I do? What can I do that I'm really actually passionate about? What's something that I want to do that I could continue doing for a long time? And for me at the time, I was like, oh, I'm going to start playing music again. I'm going to start writing my own songs. I'm going to start singing at every opportunity that I can. I'm going to play all the shows. I'm going to do all the coffee shop gigs. And I start playing in the train stations too. The, in San Francisco, it's called the BART station, the Bay Area Rapid Transit. And uh, so it has, it's this huge hall, has beautiful acoustics, beautiful acoustics. I mean, these huge halls. And people are walking through, and I'm horrible. I mean, my voice <laughs> is terrible. Because I've never learned how to sing the right way. Never. Oh. I mean, I could maybe hold a tune a little bit, but my tone is bad, my pitch is bad, and my favorite singers at the time are like Jeff Buckley and Elliot Smith and Tom York. Mm. All these guys that sing incredibly high and very, very well. Well, the interesting thing about vocal technique is that it's really easy to sing high notes at a really low volume. So if mm. you're recording yourself and you're in your studio and you're like, recognize, you know, you can basically just, just kind of BS those notes in, in what I'd call falsetto. And so mm. I'm out and I'm performing in a public space and I'm trying to be heard over the trains and over all the people walking through. And my voice is just terrible because all of a sudden I have to learn how to project that sound and I have yeah. no idea how to do it. And so after every, you know, performance of this, after like, you know, I could usually maybe do an hour, maybe two hours of singing, my voice would be completely shot. 
And so I'm like, wow, I really need, and, and it all culminated one day because someone threw a can at me while I was singing. And I was like, <laughs> man, I, I, need to, I need to do this thing a little bit better. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was just having a bad day, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think, kind of enough to doubt, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it was, I think part of it had to do with me and I was just maybe the icing on his, on his crappy cake that morning. Um, <laughs> So I'm like, man, I need to get some help. So I ask around and I'm like, hey, does anyone know anyone that takes voice lessons? Anyone know a vocal coach? And uh, this guy that I worked with named Thomas was like, oh, yeah, uh, there's this guy that that this this person that I knew from this band who knows this guy. They know this guy who teaches voice lessons over in Oakland. So I go and I start taking my first voice lessons. And for the next three months, I'm taking voice lessons every week and my voice is getting way, way better. Fast forward, after that three months, I have to move from San Francisco. It's just too gosh darn expensive. It's just crazy. I'm living in a walk-in closet for $600 a month. I mean, it's just nuts. And so I moved to Austin and I find this fantastic voice teacher here and he's teaching more of the great stuff. My voice continues to improve. I'm playing better gigs. I'm joining bands, all that stuff. And then after a year of working with him, he's kind of like, you just figured out what I was doing, why I was doing this exercise. Why don't you start teaching some of the stuff yourself? And I'm like, no way, man. I'm going to be <laughs> on tour. I'm going to be selling records. I'm going to be hooking up with hot chicks, all this stuff. And uh, no thank you. No interest in teaching. And uh, what eventually happened was I got kind of curious and I was like, why not just give it a try? So I started teaching a couple of my friends for free. And what I found was I absolutely love teaching. I love the mystery of, of helping people, you know, kind of un, unblock things or overcome obstacles in their voice. It's endlessly fascinating. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is just doing a bunch of crazy exercises that no one would ever think of right. as being helpful but they are actually incredibly helpful. And, uh, of course, you know, you don't want to just lip trill really well. You actually want to sing really well. But the yeah. thing is, is that yeah. those exercises actually do translate to singing your songs better. And I, I think that not enough bands do them. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. Th there's so much to unpack there. Thank you for sharing that story, first of all. That's, that's really impressive. I think it's kind of funny that you first were sure that you have no interest in teaching and then found out that it's actually really funny <laughs> or yeah. like really not, not funny, but like, um, really like it's fun to teach. That's what yeah. I was saying. So that, that is, I found that inter interesting because sometimes we just don't know what we're really good at and what we actually like doing. Yeah. And, um, but I, I also think it's a story that so many people can relate to because I'm pretty sure that most people in bands have never either th even thought about taking vocal lessons or like, uh, like, yeah. And, and, and most of them definitely haven't taken vocal, vocal lessons. And especially in those heavier genres, you mentioned singing in a screamo band. And I was, I am a part of that scene as well. Yeah. I know so many people who definitely hurt themselves on a regular basis yeah. because they just don't know how to do it properly. And for some reason, it's kind of, I don't know what it is. It's, I don't know what's, what's, what's holding people back, but for some reason it's, it's as if you were not supposed to take lessons or it was something, I don't know. Um, it's, it's this weird thing where people think you, not only that you don't have to, but you shouldn't take lessons or something like that. It's, 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 it's really weird. I mean, there's kind of this inverse relationship sometimes I think with like, it's like the heavier, the genre, the more damage it's the more risk there is to, to hurting your voice but also the less likely that person is to, to take lessons <laughs> yeah. because yeah, it's like, no it's kind of like, oh, that's the wimpy thing to do. Like you just yeah. need to sing through it because it's all passion, right? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I see my job as kind of like two in, in two specific ways of helping those kinds of people. Number one, you want to, you never, as a vocal coach, you never want to stop somebody from doing what they need to do for their genre. Like, so let's just get that out of the way right now. If you start taking vocal lessons, you're not going to turn into an opera singer. That's <laughs> not the goal. The goal is to help you do what you're already doing, but better. So that's like the, on the one hand is like eliminate as many of the bad habits as you can. And I know that's going to sound really scary because it's like, well, the bad habits are what make me sound really good. They're not like whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, there's a healthier 
and a better way of doing it, which guess what is going to help you do it even and, and sound mm-hmm. even better. Now, yeah. you know, you might go into the recording studio and there might be that one take where you just, ah! you know, you just really go for it. And it just, that's the take that everybody keeps. But we're talking about like doing this in a sustainable way. You go on tour. Guess what? You have to do that every single night. And what do we see at the end of the performance? Hey, you guys sing it. You know, you guys (laughs) do this part now, right? It's like, yeah, it just (laughs) just can't hold it together. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. There's a parallel in every instrument, I think, that might help our audience like understand why we're saying that you need lessons because when you first pick up a guitar most people have tried to play guitar when you first pick up a guitar it is easier to play with one finger <laughs> like try and learn smoke on the water with one finger and you're you know you're plucking with your thumb because that's also feels more natural but turns out you're gonna suck at guitar if you stick with that right <laughs> unless you start using all your fingers and learn some technique and grab a pick or whatever you're gonna be a terrible guitarist that is kind of the the parallel of of singing, right? You like naturally, you might have a good tone. You might have be able to be loud just with natural talent. Some people can, some people can't, and yeah. that might kind of lead to the illusion of I don't need lessons. I can sing. This is working. But imagine if you learned the right way, how much like you just that your trajectory of talent would just kind of bypass your natural ability very yeah. quickly, and and then all of a sudden you're on a whole new pain, plane, um, and it's also uh, like the longevity is there as well because right. vocals is the one thing that if you don't do it right, you might not be able to do it in the future. Um, yeah. where, like, there's, there's so much potential for damage where guitar, you might get a blister on your thumb if you don't use a pick, but you're going to get through it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, even, also, even singers yeah. with really, really good vocal technique still have this issue sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like we're looking at like Justin Timberlake, Sam Smith, yeah. Adele, like even singers that, not that Adele necessarily has great technique, but like non-aggressive forms of singing, those singers deal with this too if you put them on tour 200 days a year, you know? So it's like, this is not something that is just just for aggressive singers only. It's kind of singer-wide. It's really just more of a, if you're just a little bit off kilter, it's kind of like a ship. If you just turn the ship just a couple of degrees you're not going to notice a big difference right away. But you leave that ship in that same course for two weeks, and all of a sudden you're way, way, way off in the middle of the ocean where you never want it to be. And that's what often happens with vocal technique. You start Mm. off with these little cheats, and then it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And because you're not able to hit that note anymore, you start pushing, and then it's even harder to hit that note, so you push some more. And then it's even harder to hit that note, and then you're not even close to it. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think also just like it can be effortless, but it doesn't have to sound effortless. Like it can sound full of energy and as if the voice was breaking up, but it doesn't have to be that way, you know, like there's this difference. So because people are afraid that it's going to sound weak, but you can still make it sound as aggressive and desperate or whatever you want to we want it to sound like, but it it can be effortless at the same time or at least require less effort than before. So I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that's the case. And then. But there's one thing that I'm curious about if you have any advice on this, because the one thing that I always struggle with that I I don't really have a solution other than just shut up is what do you do after, like when you're on tour or when you're in between like long recording sessions, what do you do before the show, after the show, in between the sessions? Because I often found that the, the, the talking in a loud environment for hours after the show, before the show is, would, would do more damage than the actual, like, 60 minutes on stage or whatever. So is there anything we can do um, when we're not singing, just like in our normal life or just when we're talking to people that can improve the longevity and like make sure we can, we can do this for weeks in a row? That's a great question, Benedict. So let's, let's set the scene for a second. So it's, it's 6 AM. You've been driving all night and you have to wake up early to do this radio interview. So you're talking, talking, talking about promoting the show tonight. Right. Then you go back to the hotel, you eat some crappy food, you maybe get a couple more hours of sleep, then you have to wake up and you have to do sound check. And then you go back to the hotel, you probably eat more crappy food, all this stuff. It's getting close to showtime. You have a couple of drinks to get into the mood and to start, you know, calming the nerves and feel feel good about what you're about to do. You get up on stage, then you sing your 60 minutes, you throw it all out on the stage. 
And then after the 60 minutes is over, you got meet and greets, you got to talk to a bunch of people, you're probably having a couple more drinks, you're in a loud place where you have to really project a lot. And then you go and, you know, it's super late, you go and have a, a few crappy hours of sleep, and then you do it all over again. That's pretty much like you could you could optimize almost every step of, <laughs> yeah, of yeah, that day, for sure. <laughs> and you for could sure. and you would have a much much better uh, experience, a much better singing experience, especially when you look at things cumulatively. Now, yeah. maybe surprising to a lot of the people that are listening to this, but the majority of the students that I teach are are more at the beginner level or intermediate level. But what I'm talking about is when you are coaching somebody that's at that level where they have to be out all the time and they're constantly working, you got to think of your voice like a gas tank. It's like, how much gas do you need in order to make it through that 60 minutes? And where can you save some gas along the way, right? You know, maybe you could be eating, you know, more healthy food along the way. You could be making sure that you're getting better sleep, if at all possible. Um, you can limit your talking throughout the day if you want to. Uh, you know, talking is kind of a double-edged sword. I don't see any issue with talking at the level that we're talking at. But okay. if you're, like, trying to yell over people in a crowded bar and there's, uh, you know, alcohol and smoke and all that other stuff involved, yeah, I mean, these are some of the other factors that can add to it. And don't let me don't let me take it take it away because the, the artist or the person that's doing this knows their voice best. I'm just a person that like I've been doing this long enough. Like I know that my voice is like a little bit of a princess, and that like it needs it needs good sleep. You know, it needs to have lots of water. I need to warm up before I do stuff. If I feel if I'm gonna feel good about what I'm gonna do up there, but there are other people that it's like you know there's a there's a bar here in Austin, this little hole in the wall called the Skylark Lounge. It's literally like in between like a bunch of tractor trailers. And it's like this tiny, tiny, probably like 20 square feet wide. Like you walk in and it's like walking into a railroad car. And I've seen some dudes there that are just like, they're singing old school blues and they've got like a cigarette hanging out of their mouth and they're just drinking scotch, mm -hmm. you know, in between every, every set. And like he goes off in solo so I can drink some more scotch. And it's like, they're fine. You know, it's totally fine. So you have to know your own body and you have to know what you personally can deal with. And unfortunately, so many singers only find that out the hard way. Right. Okay. That's an interesting conversation to have as well, because some people think that like the whole drinking, smoking, whatever is part of, of or think it's part of their genre or their scene or the, the style they want to, or what their heroes did or whatever. People think that that, that, that is required to sound like that sometimes and they like, yeah. they just and I don't obviously I don't want to encourage anybody to smoke or drink alcohol or anything so I always I always think and I really think that that you can sound like that and you can have just as a like a dirty voice or whatever you want to call it without doing those things but what do you say if if like people really believe that this is part of not only of the lifestyle but if they think they have to have a whiskey and a cigar or whatever or a cigarette or whatever in order to sound like that. Oh man. So this is this is the worst thing yeah. to do. Let me just tell you the worst thing to do. Yes. So at that same time, 21, 22 years old, living in San Francisco, my one of my favorite artists at the time was Tom Waits. And he's got mm. the you know super rattly, raspy voice. And so I was reading his his biography and Tom Waits uh, Tom Waits makes a ton of stuff up. So you never know what's true and what's not. <laughs> yeah. But I read that he got that voice by screaming into pillows. He would literally cover his face with pillows and scream into them before he would record a vocal take and he was also of course a big smoker and stuff like that. So this is the worst thing to do. I did that <laughs> for like 3 months <laughs> because I was like I wanted to sound just like him. Now Anyone that's listening to this, you can probably tell that I am a higher voice type. I've got a higher voice for a dude. I'm a, a very, very typical tenor sound. Matter of fact, I'm a little bit of a higher tenor sound, which usually means that my voice is going to be pretty bright. It's going to be pretty clear. It's going to behave pretty well on high notes. Tom Waits is the complete 180 opposite of that. I mean, he is born to sing those low notes. It, that's all just kind of built into his voice. Now, yeah, the cigarettes and the alcohol probably, you know, helped accentuate some of that right. for him. 
But one of the worst things that you can do, and this is kind of the, <laughs> this is kind of what I learned, is like trying to adapt someone else's style as your own, especially mm. if they're not a good fit. Like Tom Waits is the worst fit for my voice. And a lot of, you know, people when they're first starting out or or when they're first writing music, they have no idea where they kind of fit into the into the into the uh, vast, you know, spectrum of things and of voices and of singers. So I would just say that you could probably do a lot of exploration about where your voice behaves best. Just be really curious about like, hey, where does my voice sound good? What what are other singers that this sounds like? Rather than saying like, I want to sound like X, so I'm going to do everything that X did in mm. order to to get that sound. Right. Okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. It's, awesome. it's a lot harder to lift the style of like a vocalist than any other instrument, you know. And sure, you can learn tricks, I'm sure, by trying to like pick up what other vocalists do. Like, I remember when I was first getting into singing, Chris Martin fascinated me with his like little like shifts into head voice and yeah. mid voice kind of thing. Yep. So I wanted to learn that, but obviously I have a pretty low voice. So, like, Chris Martin is not who I sound like when I sing at all. <laughs> well, what's um, interesting about what you said, Malcolm, is you might actually have an easier time. So, I have a harder time kind of shifting into that. Nobody said it was easy. I have a harder time with that uh, than a lower voice actually might. Because uh, for a lower really? voice, they have a, they have a harder time getting up to those those head voice notes in a full sound uh, by a full sound. I mean, nobody said right, with so you that kind of chest the whole time. Yeah, with yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, with a lower voice, they might be more tempted. To, nobody said they might. They might actually nail that falsetto better than I can. Just a <laughs> quick little tidbit there, because I have to really concentrate on making those flips. Because my voice Are really wants to I mix those. Are you saying I can those. be Chris Martin? You can. You can. Sorry, I'm, forget I'm everything saying, I said ten minutes. Ago. I've been following you the wrong Chris dreams. Martin. <laughs> I'm saying that I want to hear what you just did, man. I want to hear that from you, Malcolm, right now. <laughs> uh, that would take some whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. This podcast is going wrong. It's all yeah. wrong. Exactly. Um, They've learned nothing. That... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wh I, I learned something earlier today when I was trying out your app, by the way, because I don't yeah, know, man, um, I did that experiment with the rangefinder app. Um, like if I could, I, I tried the falsetto and the lowest notes and like, I tried to figure out, figure out my range and I was apparently not, I think I don't did very well <laughs> compared <laughs> to other people that I know who tried this app. Uh, it said, uh, I'm, I'm close to three octaves, like from a flat to F sharp, I think, or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, I'm just curious, uh, like if, if you're wondering people listening, go to rangefinder.com ramseyvoice.com rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com we're going to put that in the show notes and you can try it out yourself it's a funny app where you can detect, like see what your what your range is like how far how low you can go how high you can go and how much space is there in between basically and um i'm wondering what's the average there what, what do people typically hit do you see those numbers well actually actually benedict i'm i'm going to turn this around on you for a second so you said that you sang it was nearly three octaves is that yeah. what it was Okay, great. Yeah. From a what to a what? I think a, uh, what was it? Oh, no, I, I said it completely wrong. From an F sharp to an A flat, I, th I think. Yeah. F, F, F sharp what? To A flat what? Um, F sharp, check, check F sharp three, F sharp two. F sharp two, I think. And then okay. it was, it said, it said well done, like over, over two octaves. So and, and okay. I just looked at the notes. So it was almost three octaves, I think. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So let me ask you, Benedict, what do you think the average range of a singer is? I have no idea, actually, because uh, I don't even know if I did it properly because I did the lowest note I could do. And then I did obviously did the highest falsetto squeak that I could do. Yeah. Like, it was not yeah, really yeah. a note from like not nothing from the chest. I just did that the highest noise I could make. And that is so. totally fine. That's exactly the way you're supposed to use it. Okay. Use it okay, and cool. abuse it. Malcolm, do you have a guess on the on the average vocal range of a uh, singer? I, I would have said three, but I, I don't know. Nice. Okay, cool. So 
you guys are both victims of propaganda <laughs> of, of this of these of these singers that they look at these ranges and they're like, I've got six octaves of range. And yeah. you and you see that you've got like three octaves and you're like, oh, and you feel bad about yourself, right? So here's the thing. So I've analyzed over 300 vocal songs for males and females. I put them together in two different books, uh, which will be released soon. But part of the analysis was I analyzed the vocal ranges used in them. And we're talking about huge songs. I mean, like, for instance, I demoed The Scientist by, by Coldplay. And, you know, there's Sam Smith, there's heavy rock, there's Chris Cornell, there's, you know, tons of stuff. So across those 300 songs, the average range of the vocal of the of the vocalist during the song is just an octave and a half right right just an octave and a half so when you see three octaves you feel bad because you hear like mariah carey's got like six octaves because she can (laughs) sing in crazy whistle register or maybe they can sing in like vocal fry like way down to like a low note or something like that but here's the good news you really just have to have I would say a really, really good command of two octaves of range. Now that's harder than it sounds because most people, before they do any sort of vocal training, they probably about have like an octave of range that they use typically before they start running into uh, what we in the biz called their first passage, their transition between their chest voice and their head voice. So mm. a lot of people, uh, and they'll just try to pull the bottom part all the way up to their high notes rather than making that transition uh, up to the top part of their voice. So a lot of singers have a really hard time bridging the gap between those two places. So um, when I say an octave and a half of range, typically that means that you're going to have to do some work to, to mm-hmm. make it through that passage and sing through that area Well, uh, we were talking about the scientist a second ago. Learning how to sing between that falsetto and that chest voice, really, really important to learn how to do because if you're not, most likely you're eliminating a lot of your potential vocal range. So once you get that, getting an octave and a half is pretty darn easy. It's pretty darn easy to do. It's just more about making those notes sound good. So right, people are like, right. oh, I've got seven octaves. And it's like, yeah, yeah but, you know, how, <laughs> how good do the notes sound? You know, is it, ah! wants to hear you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, who yeah. wants to hear that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, totally. I, I think I just thought I did bad because I did badly because, A, I, I cheated. Like I did the, the highest noise and not really a note, but you said it's not cheating. Yeah, but that's that was not a what cheat. I did. Yeah, and and then the second thing is I know that I've tried to sing in, in bands a couple of times and it never worked out really well. I mean, I can I can hit the I, I, the intonation is not bad, but just my voice is not not trained, and I I and I always felt like I had a very very limited range because I can sing along to like any of my sing- favorite songs when I'm singing quietly, like as you did yeah. in the intro, and you show yep. like you can you can just sing along, and you think like I can do this, and as soon as you start to sing loud, it's either too low or too high, but rarely is there a song where I can really sing it. Like, I rarely I feel like it's in my range. And even when I'm writing songs or when someone in the band writes a song, I always instantly have the... I, I feel like I need to transpose it. Like, it never fits. And, like, either it's too high or it's too low, but it just never fits. So I, I'm always assuming that I just have a limited range like that. I, I think that's where it comes from. Right. So, so you, your app so you, says I have these three octaves, but I don't. Re- I can't really use them properly. Right, right, right. So, So you go to the gym, right? And there's, there's all those resistance machines that you can lift weights with, right? And so you can, let's say you can just do like kind of like a, a, a barbell curl or something like that where you're just lifting up your arms with no weight. And you can actually do that full motion. Well, that's vocal range. Once you start putting weight on it, once you start increasing the resistance, mm. all of a sudden things get really tough. And that's yeah. the volume issue okay. that you're talking about. It's like, you can sing, ah, no problem, you know. Oh, won't you stay with me? Yeah. <laughs> but once you start adding some weight onto that, guess what? You're going to start breaking. Why? Because all of a sudden you've put some resistance onto those vocal cords. You're mm. actually using more of the muscle. And as a result of that, your voice doesn't know how to handle that because it hasn't been trained to do that. So everyone's, I wouldn't say everyone, but 97% of people, at least out of the ones that I've taught, 
all have the ability to expand their range dramatically, but actually making that connect um, with with the right amount of muscle, that's that's the work. When you look at a singer, like for instance, like I grew up like loving the used, like Burt McCracken, like fantastic singer, right? Like love his voice. And what I love about Burt's voice is that he has the clean tone that's often like really nasal. And he also has a get to you know, that really, yeah. really like screamy kind of stuff too. And what's interesting about that is like, he's kind of learned how to do both. And what I want to encourage a lot of the people that are listening to more aggressive music and, and trying to sing that kind of stuff is like, learn how to do both because they'll start to kind of balance each other out a little bit. Okay, cool. So yeah. you're saying it's actually for most people, not as important to to increase their actual range as it is to be able to control the range they already have or like use it properly and, and use it loud. So is that what you're saying? Because we, we oh, think yeah. we have to increase our range, but basically we already got it. We just have to train it so we can actually use it and put more weight onto it, like as you said. Absolutely. And then you'll get to a certain point. So it's like to go back to the weightlifting analogy. So you can you can lift, let's say, like 50 pounds with that full extension, right? But as soon as you knock it up to 60 pounds, all of a sudden you can only go like three quarters of the way, right? right. So your range is kind of like, is kind of uh, inhibited somewhat. So what you have to do is you have to like stay at that 50 pounds until you can get the full range and that's comfortable. And then you can start to add more weight onto it again. So oftentimes when I'm working with people in lessons, yeah, we're expanding the range a ton, but at the same time, I may be, you know, I may bring them up to like an E5 for for a male tenor or something like that. But I'll really be focusing mostly on the E4 or the F4 or mm. the G4 or the G sharp 4 because those are the really tricky notes. Okay, cool. So do you have any quick exercise or something we can do on a daily basis or regularly just to help um, train that a little bit or or maybe... Um, yeah, maybe expand our range or just or just get more confident with hitting those high notes a little louder or like, is there anything we can do? Like a Absolutely. quick little thing? Absolutely. So I think a lot of people have probably, and I've talked about it already, they've seen like these lip trills demonstrated before. But what I want to tell you is more importantly than just this crazy exercise, why you want to do this exercise. So in uh, a lip trill, in case you're unfamiliar, is like this thing where you take your two fingers, you place it in the middle of your cheeks, and you let your lips flop together like, like that. And then you add in a little bit of voice, like a to it. And then what you do is you can put that on a scale. So for instance, I'll do an octave and a half arpeggio like this. Now, what you can do is you can take that lip trill and you can put it on that octave and a half. So, and you can move it around. And by the way, I know I'm playing that really fast, but you can find all that stuff on my YouTube channel. But the yeah. reason why, I mean, let's all be honest. This is a crazy exercise. Like, there's no reason, like everybody, like the last thing that the lead singer of a metal band wants to be <laughs> seen doing seen backstage doing. is, <laughs> man, I really thought a lot about Randy Blythe before, but now, you know, it's <laughs> so, so, um, but the reason why this exercise is so helpful is basically anytime you close something in your throat, and I'll define closure in just a second. Anytime you close something in your throat, you're keeping more of the sound waves that you're creating from the vocal cords in your throat. And that actually helps the vocal cords close and vibrate better. So anytime you're introducing some sort of a resistance in your throat, it usually helps the vocal cords close a little bit better. What's an example of a closure in your throat? Well, in the case of the lip trill, I'm closing my lips. My lips are flopping. So the sound waves are hitting my lips. And yes, some of them are leaving my voice, but many of them are actually going back to my mm -hmm. vocal cords. And that's actually helping them to close better. What's another example of a closure in your throat? Well, how about a like with your tongue? So you could do a if you're really good at rolling your R's. Or you could even do the same thing on an 
like rung where I'm dropping my soft palate and all of the sound is vibrating in my nasal cavity and not all of it is leaving my nose. So some of it is actually going back to helping my chords. So now it sounds nasal and ugly and all of these exercises <laughs> are horrible sounding. They're terrible <laughs> sounding exercises, but what they all do is they all help your vocal cords to continue closing, and that's exactly what you want when you're going from low to high, because everybody has that uh and, yeah, in their voice. I have that for sure. <laughs> exactly. But if you do it, if you go all of a sudden there's no break. Right. Well, there is a break, but you just can't hear it as well, which is kind of the goal. Yeah. Right. It's like you want it, you want those notes to sound powerful and you don't also don't want to just uh, just strain up to it. And you also don't want it to be uh, so if instead you get that uh, you can find that nice middle spot. Right. So I was wow. told that doing lip trills is uh it's like makes it harder for you to hurt yourself as well. Like it's a great warm up because it um, doesn't strain you pretty much. Is is that yeah. true? Yeah. Well, why why would that be, Malcolm? Think think about what we just talked about. Why? why uh, yeah, would I that... think it, like you're helping your yourself out by like sending energy back, um, and right. then also like the volume is somewhat limited. You can't really shout a lip trill, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So you know, if you're saying get up, you know, just really ah, or. Uh, I think uh, one of my favorite, I think it's in, which lie is the one, you know, or something like that, like a strike anywhere kind of sound. Yeah. If you're doing those notes on a trill, you're getting all of that beneficial energy going back to the vocal cords. So guess what? You don't have to try as hard. Right. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. don't have to push quite as hard just to make the same sound. Um, so things just get a lot easier. And yes, just to go back to Benedict's earlier question about, hey, what can you do like, you know, before a performance or after a performance? Well, honestly, I would recommend doing these lip trills before performance and even after. As Malcolm mentioned, it's like, you know, this is one of the best exercises to kind of help relax and decompress mm -hmm. your voice after a really big performance. So if you're just like really, really going for it for a long time and your voice is feeling totally, I wouldn't say totally shot, but pretty pretty roughed up then you can add these in but if your voice is feeling totally shot vocal rest for sure right awesome what about keeping the vocal cords and everything wet because i know or like keeping the moisture like up because obviously drinking a lot of water is important but i know a couple of singers a couple of hardcore singers as well greg bennick is an is an example of the band trial i don't know if you know them it's it's a pretty well-known hardcore band and he always travels with a small electric kettle and as soon as the show is over he would sit backstage open up the the kettle and just breathe steam for an hour or so yeah and he would do that every night and he would drink lots of water and he basically keeps it wet all the time um so d is that something that helps absolutely yeah and they even have like personal steamers which mm. sounds kind of weird when you say that it's a personal steamer it's my own <laughs> uh, but there's like what do you use that for um but they actually have ones that fit like over your nose and over your mouth that like it generates steam and you just inhale it um steam is very very beneficial for for the singing voice for exactly the same way that you're saying like you want to keep the vocal folds hydrated because what they actually are is thin layers of muscle and mucus and membrane and that's it that's like all that's your that's your guitar string rather mm -hmm. than it getting made out of steel it's made out of flesh and blood <laughs> and so if it gets dried out if it gets abused if there's too much smoke going across it or if you're just waking up in the morning and you're totally dehydrated it usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes for the water that i'm drinking right now to actually circulate through my body and make it to my vocal folds mm, that's whereas so with steam Interesting. boom it's there it's immediate so and you don't have to get super crazy you don't have to go and buy a personal steamer you can just get in a hot shower in the morning or before you you your performance or something like that and breathe in the steam there as you're right. doing some some crazy exercises. 
Yeah. So, so <laughs> Benny awesome. and I are both, uh, we're both runners and, and like with running, you got to stay hydrated, but the best time to hydrate is before you feel like you need to hydrate. By then yeah. it's too late. You're already dehydrated. And it's, yeah, it's the same thing you said. It takes a while for totally. drinking to actually do anything that help you. I mean, it, it feels like awesome as soon as you start drinking something when you're thirsty. But I mean, beer does the same thing and that's not going to help yeah. you while you're running, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and also yeah. With, with alcohol, you know, your body interprets alcohol as a toxin, you know? Mm. And so your vocal cords react to that by swelling up right. um, slightly. So not only is it going to, you know, make you pee more and dehydrate you and all that other stuff, but also it's going to add a little bit of inflammation to your vocal cords and stuff right. like that. But again, okay. you know, as, as a singer, like, you know what you can handle for me. Like I can't have any drinks before I sing. I'll drink after, after the show or whatever it is. Right. You it know? depends on what you have to do the next day, but yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And like how long the tour still is and stuff like that. But yeah, for sure. You're right. Um, the, now there's an, a thing that I've always been wondering because I heard that drinking, certain teas that people sometimes drink because they think it improves their voice um, might actually hurt your vocal cords or is bad because of some essential oils that are like the acidity or whatever is in there, I don't know, is like bad for the vocal cords. So I heard that water is actually the best and you shouldn't even drink certain types of tea or, or certain types of things that, that people often think are good. Like, what about that? Is that... What is what is true about that or false about well, that? <laughs> well, you you heard right, Benny. Um, okay. Any anything that's not that's not water, you know, is just like I mean. So people people get kind of crazy about you know their their rituals. They you know they're like if I just drink throat coat tea or if I you know drink this you know licorice tea or whatever it happens to be, they're like this is the thing that that really works for my voice. And if it works for you, then keep doing it. You know. Yeah. But, like, if we're just talking general, 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 anything besides water is just kind of, like, you know, probably going to, you know, add something that you might have to get rid of somehow. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, for, for years and years and years, people were, like, hot water with, with lemon and honey. And yeah. I don't really see any... <laughs> any big benefit with either of those things yeah uh, so you know i it i think it makes the hot water taste better is i think what really is <laughs> what's really going on here uh, so okay, that's cool. you know whatever it takes to get you drinking drinking more water uh that's fine yeah awesome. i think it's Thank like you. the illusion of soothing <laughs> yeah it's kind Probably. of the benefit there yeah, probably. And then the, I remember one thing you said before, Matt, like right in the beginning, you said briefly that you should sleep enough and that sleep mm, is obviously yeah. important when you're on tour. But in general, it's important, I think. So and that is something that I, I think is really underrated and people don't even make the connection between how well or how much they sleep and how, how well they are able to perform and what their voice sounds like. So w what's actually the important thing about getting enough sleep and, and good quality sleep? Yeah, well, I mean, the your your body has a lot more important priorities when you have really poor sleep than helping you sing better. It's like on the on the it. yeah, on the evolutionary, you know, pyramid of <laughs> this is what's going to keep, you know, Benny alive today, um, you know, eating, metabolism, like all that stuff Co completely supersedes singing even on days <laughs> when you sleep really well yeah. um so on days when you're not sleeping well literally like your brain is just not optimized for helping you access those kind of finer muscle details it's more about like because that's why you just feel so groggy right it's like okay we're, we're spending a lot of energy on just keeping this dude awake alive alert you know making sure that a saber-toothed tiger doesn't eat him singing can probably <laughs> just get to the back of the line and of course you know your body your your evolutionary body doesn't know that you're a singer and singing just to bring it to a larger point is like very unimportant in general of, of, <laughs> of the business of keeping you alive i mean it's kind of a miracle of evolution that we even figured out how to use this kind of really crazy valve that we have in our throat to make all the sounds that we do. Right. But over time, of course, you know, people grew to love that sound. And, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. But yeah, we're one of the few, few 
uh, beings in the world that can actually make art with our with our throats, which mm -hmm. primarily they're just for yelling for help or yeah. or communicating <laughs> communicating ah food, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. But Maybe if we sing really terribly, the saber-toothed tiger stays away. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Exactly. Now, that is actually pretty cool. That would probably put him asleep or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm just going to try singing to him. Hold on one second. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, Joe, you, you have a pointy stick. No, I'm just going to try something real quick. I'm just going to try to sing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, small, small, uh, <laughs> irrelevant story, kind of relevant, but I, I met up with a, a, a mixer, his name's Tim Archer, and he does like the location sound and post mixing for IMAX movies. Um, nice. And he went and recorded wolves and ran into a wolf like really close to him, set down his recorder, and he just kind of sat there. And he ended up howling at the wolf, and the wolf yeah. howled back, and then they just like exchanged howls like eight times in a row. Freaking amazing. So, so cool. But like, that's like, imagine. Kind of, I mean, it's so weird. <laughs> it's like yeah. is, two two different animals a, communicating with their voices. Is a oh, wolf wow. one of those that you're supposed to make yourself look really big? I know that's for a bear, but what about for yeah, a wolf? Yeah, I, I I believe so. Because uh, wolves are like pack animals. This one was on its own, so it probably would have been like, I'm not messing with this big big guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Howl, and he can also howl. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what i'm dealing with here yeah <laughs> i wonder what the wolf was hearing like what, what the guy was saying yeah, to the yeah, wolf totally. basically that would be interesting to know <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. do, you, do you guys remember that scene at the end of anchorman where the the dog is like barking at the bear and it's like the bear can <laughs> understand what he's saying it's like yeah. Yeah. i met one of your tribe in my travels <laughs> like, and After then there's like off there's yeah, they're <laughs> by Jack Black, no less. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's oh, awesome. great. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you, you've been saying it um, before that you are you obviously give lessons to people. Um, that's what you do as a vocal coach, and you do that online. I um, I think primarily, right? Or do you do yeah. it in person as well? Is yeah, that... I do it. I so I started off uh, teaching in person lessons ten years ago uh, here in Austin. And, you know, f almost from the very get-go, almost as soon as I had my YouTube channel and my blog and stuff like that, people would, uh, people would take online lessons with me as well mm -hmm. if they didn't happen to be in Austin. And so, you know, during the pandemic, it n not a whole lot really changed for me because I'd already been teaching online. The weird thing now is when I'll have a student from Austin take an online lesson with me. And I'm like, yeah, we're we're like only 20 minutes away from each other, but yeah. traffic's really bad here. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I even I even asked some people. I was like, hey, you know, like if I started doing in person lessons again, you know, would you? Is that something that you'd want to do? And they're like, honestly, I, I think it's just really convenient to just pop online. So literally, like to to the people that are listening, there's literally no difference. Uh, between the in person and the, cool. the the Skype or the Zoom or uh, FaceTime lesson. Right. Cool. cool. I, I'm asking because I'm wondering what is the main thing, the main reason, the main why behind you know, people coming to you? Like, why do people hit you up? Why do people want to take vocal lessons primarily? Like, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Is it because of the range thing or is it the longevity or is it because they want to sound like somebody? And if so, like, which type of voice is do they want to mimic or what is it? Why do people come to you and take lessons in the first place? Well, those are certainly some surface reasons, Benedict, of like why people yeah. they are like, oh, I want more control. I want more range. I want to improve my tone. But like I'm always looking at like the deeper why with my singers too of like, hey, what, like what, why now? What's going on? And, and oftentimes what I see is this pattern of a person. I'll, I'll tell you like right now my kind of like my target audience but also the people that just i shouldn't even say target it's just the people that find me and really connect with me are usually like they tend to be in like their mid-20s or their 30s they're pretty stable in their career usually they're usually doing something kind of creative that might also be an austin thing too but like oftentimes they're like programmers or they work in marketing or sales or something like that and it's like singing was this thing that uh fell by the wayside sometime during their life or it was something that was actively discouraged and they're like 
hey, I'm finally in a point in my life where I'm feeling good, I'm feeling secure, like I know where my next paycheck's coming from, and I, I want to be creative. I want to access that feeling again. And with singing, there's just something about it that is so incredibly creative and unique to you, but at the same time, very vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? So you've got both sides. You've got this like, you know, I'm teaching guys that like played football all through high school and were told like they, you know, maybe learn to play like three chords on an acoustic guitar, but they were like, oh, I, I've always wanted to, you know, to be a singer. And now they've, they've got it. They're in a place where it's like, I'm interested in, in learning how to do this thing. And it's like, we have to like dig down and like get into like some of that stuff sometimes, which is like, yeah, who told you that you couldn't sing? Cause you're doing just fine. Like right. you match this pitch. And that is so, so common. And it bums me out sometimes, honestly, um, that there are so many people that are like, oh, I love singing. I could never do that. And it's like, oh, those are two completely different ideas. <laughs> you know, those are two. If, yeah. you have a, if you can speak, you can sing. Right. That's an encouraging thing to say and re really cool to hear that. And yeah, I was, I was asking for exactly that reason because I thought there was a deeper why for most people. So, yeah, I mean... That's, that's interesting because yeah. as you said, it's this, it's, it's the only, the voice is really the only instrument I feel like that has this, this personal vulnerable um, component to it. Like most people are not, like you can tell a guitarist that he messed up a take or she messed up a take. You can say it to a drummer that like, do it over again. Like that was not in time and they won't probably won't be hurt as quickly. But if you say uh, that I don't to a know. singer, I've met, I've I mean, met some miss... sensitive drummers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. But I think that um, you got to be especially careful with vocalists just because it's such a personal thing. Like the in instrument is you and there's so much that goes into, into being a singer or wanting to sing. And like, and then if they write the, the lyrics themselves, there's even more to that. And I don't know. It's, yeah. it's just a, a very special Thing, um, well, right. yeah, I mean, it's it's very going back to kind of the psychology of singing. It's like oftentimes I'll see people that were in choirs and stuff like that when they were kids, and they had a choir teacher that was probably like super overworked, probably super stressed, had to teach a bunch of other stuff in addition. And it, for me, it's easy. Like I just I show up, you know, I sit in front of my piano and I help people sing better. And mm. it's it's not like the same kind of thing. Much love to my choir teachers out there, by the way. But oftentimes I'll have some singers that come to me and they'll be like, oh, yeah, my choir teacher told me that I, you know, couldn't do this or, or you know, I had a neighbor who said they heard me and said I sounded terrible or whatever it is. And it's like you've got to really get to the root of that stuff mm -hmm. sometimes and really show that. And it's, it's an uphill battle, frankly, because a lot of people get mm -hmm. discouraged from singing very young. It's kind of right. like any artistic thing where it's like, as kids, we're all like drawing and we're all painting and stuff like that. And how many of us do that as adults? Very few of us. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, there's cool. uh, like there's this thing I heard once where everybody's bad at math when they first try it because math's hard. It's not like <laughs> nobody's good at math. And because of that, we usually get told that we're bad at math because we, yeah. we li literally are. And most people then take that first impression of trying math for the first time in school, being told that they're stupid. <laughs> and yeah. now as adults, everybody thinks they're bad at math. Almost every single person thinks they're bad at math because of just their first impression. But it's like, Maybe. of course you're bad at math. You just, you're a kid trying to learn to do something hard. <laughs> and, and so, so much of what, like how we think, what we think we can do and our talents is just based on our first, like the first thing somebody said to us about it. And singing is exactly that. It's like, I tried this and somebody was, didn't like it. And that, like, you can just take that with you your whole life, which is totally yeah. a shame. Because like yeah. you said, we all can sing. You just have to learn. Yeah. yeah, totally. And it's like, we're all bad speakers at first too. Yeah, totally. I mean, <laughs> my, yeah. my girlfriend has a little nephew, not great at speaking yet. He's only three <laughs> years old. He, he's working on it. He's making yeah. some sounds. He's jamming. Um, but that's one of the coolest things that, about, uh, you know, I, I think it was a talk by Victor Wooten um, where he was talking about as kids, we're just jamming all the time with our words. We're just mm. jamming. We're constantly, and more importantly, we're jamming with experts. We're right. jamming with adults who can speak that language. But with <laughs> singing, it's just like, it's like this thing that you have or you don't have. And that's absolutely not true at all. That's, right, yeah. That's so funny because... 
I feel like that every single week when I'm talking to you, Malcolm, be, like, I feel like I'm jamming with an expert in a language that I don't speak very well because I'm not a native speaker. That's exactly my, <laughs> what I'm feeling every week. Like I'm making noises and you're like the expert. And like, <laughs> yeah, we're jamming. Yeah, we're Dude, jamming you, for you sure. You jam very well. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, like, oh, man, I don't know if you can sit in on this. I don't know if you can handle this stuff, man. <laughs> Leave this to Matt and I. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, That's so, so now for those people going into, let's say for people going into a recording session or planning their next record or whatever, and they feel like they, they are not there or they are not confident with their voice or they want to improve, but maybe they're also hesitant to take vocal lessons or they think, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to spend the money yet or whatever. Like what is an easy first step people can take? Like how, like where can they start? What's a, a first um thing people can do and then maybe figure out if vocal lessons is something they want to they want to do man that's such a great question there's so many different entry points for for people that are getting started off with this because you're right i mean it is like a financial commitment and stuff like that and and to follow back on my story it's like i didn't take vocal lessons until i hit a problem Right. So I, yeah. I see a lot of people that that have that in common that they're like, oh, I have this performance coming up or I have a recording, even with amateurs, by the way, too. They're like, I really wanted to record this for my husband or something like that. And it's like I need to I need to take some lessons to, to feel better about that. But I would say and this is just being completely honest, I would say start with my YouTube channel, just like totally. I mean, yeah. that's where most cool. singers start off. Anyway, they're like, it's it's totally accessible. But I would say, and this is something that I don't see a whole lot, is also try, if you can, if at all possible, to get feedback on your singing as you go. And try to get expert feedback. Um, because we all know, like, the neighbor's mom or whatever that, like, is like, oh, you sounded pretty good, a little off in this part. That's not helpful at all. Because you have no idea what it was that wasn't good. Most likely, you're just going to be like, oh, none of it was good. Well, you know, when you get the opinion of a vocal coach, when you get feedback from someone that actually knows what they're talking about, or even another singer, they might be like, oh, I noticed that your pitch was bad in this section. Why don't you try slowing that melody down? Try that again. Or, yeah, I noticed that you broke on this note. Why don't you try it on this exercise? That'll be, and why did you break? Well, because you were right. straining. So how can we reduce some of that strain to make that easier for you? So more importantly than than just getting started started off with YouTube, which is most what most people do, is like see if you can find some ways to get expert feedback to kind of figure out how to make that next step. Because right. I will be honest, I have seen so many people um, <laughs> that they go down the YouTube rabbit hole and they think that they have one issue, but they actually have a completely different issue. They're like, man, I I cannot sing notes strongly enough and then i get them in a lesson they're like ah and it's like whoa 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 dude no you that is not your issue that is not maybe <laughs> it was you know six months ago but it's like let's move on let's figure out the next the next right. step here cool thank you yeah that, that that's really cool so your youtube channel is ramsey voice studio so go just go to youtube and, and search ramsey voice studio what i also find pretty compelling and, and maybe it's 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 also a good a great entry point is on your website ramseyvoice.com you have a free video like you have an offer there that says learn the te uh, the top 10 mistakes singers make and how to fix them in only 20 minutes so mm. that sounds like a pretty quick win to me where people could start yeah. Um, yeah absolutely so if you go to matt's website just watch that video uh and see if it can help you and then on his youtube channel obviously like there's a ton of of great tutorials and exercises and all of that um, so right. I think you, I think with that alone, like if I look at your library of content you have there on, on YouTube, I think with that alone, you can go pretty far probably. And then, yeah, you can, you yeah. can at least take the next step. Yeah. Right. Um, because just like I was saying a second ago, it's like the hardest part is like actually knowing what's holding you back. Like what's, what is the biggest thing? You know, so many people would be like, oh, my pitch is bad. So they'll watch it like how to sing on pitch. Well, it wasn't that their, yeah, their pitch was bad, but the reason their pitch was bad was because they were straining. They were like right. pushing for the note 
and uh and that's why it was flat for instance so it's like they're they see the symptom but sometimes they misdiagnose the condition so i always think that like if you've never done any 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 vocal training whatsoever youtube's a great place to get started absolutely um but most of the time you'll see people kind of hit a stumbling point mm. and that's that's a great time to start getting a little more one-on-one -on -one feedback yeah Boldly. feedback is important and as uh, as far as i can like as far as I can see on your website here, you you offer one of like sessions. Like if people want to just want to try it, they can just book one session with you and at least get that feedback and see how it goes for them, right? So yeah, you have this this booking button on your website. So if you just want to try it and if you want to take the next step, why don't you just book a session um, with Matt and see and, and and get that feedback, sort of? Yeah, yeah Benedict, you start. Uh, just pull out your credit card. Go ahead and just you know select a good time <laughs> for you. I <laughs> and I'll I'll see you soon. <laughs> I, I might even do that. I, I, I it could be that I that I really do that because I'm not singing a band right now, but I it's something I always wanted to do taking vocal yeah. lessons. So maybe I'll maybe I'll really start doing that. Yeah, not for... not not being in a band is is a great time to start working on some of that stuff too. <laughs> yeah, because honest, no yeah, honestly, I mean, it's That's like yeah, when you're good, in a band, you're usually so busy like trying to rehearse and stuff yeah. like that that oftentimes I'll see that like. I'll give someone, you know, some techniques or something to improve a section of a song. And then as soon as they go into the rehearsal, they go right back to what their old mm. habit was. They mm. revert right back to their their latest update. And it's like, no, I want to, you, you updated a 14. You went right back to 13. R right. Give me 14 again, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it, it is interesting to kind of see the pressure that being in a band or being in a performance mindset where it's like, okay, go, 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 go what that kind of does to a vocalist. Told, Sometimes yeah. we don't have that choice, though. So, okay, first off, for, for people listening, uh, if you haven't had a vocal lesson, vocal lessons are incredibly fun. They make you feel, like, physically happy and, and energized and, like, it, like, just, like, you actually feel really good after it. But they're also just really fun, and the progress is something you can actually, like, feel yourself. So it's kind of apparent you, you can tell that you're getting better when you're in vocal lessons so highly recommend doing it even just for like fun <laughs> like honestly it doesn't have to be for any professional pursuit at all even if you don't want to be the singer in your band um then the second thing just uh, as to what you were saying there matt is that rehearsing and learning and practicing are three different things right so rehearsing with your band is playing the same songs over and over and practicing nailing how they're meant to be but learning with somebody like matt here is going to teach you new things and how to do things that you might be doing wrong better um, and new techniques. And then there's practice to kind of build those into your routine <laughs> and make them how you actually sing. Sorry if you can hear dogs right now. Uh, and then you've got to take all that stuff and put it into practice, like into your rehearsal. It has to yeah. implement into that, like you said. I like the version analogy. It's like, all right, we have to update my band <laughs> singing persona to version 15 now <laughs> yeah. and bring this in. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, group lessons. I don't know if you've ever done that, but one of like the biggest steps my band ever took was going from having our lead singer who could sing and had started taking lessons eventually as well while we were in the band, um, which was, was hugely beneficial. But at a certain point, we were like, okay, every big band we open for, everybody on stage is singing Wicked Harmonies, yeah. and we're not doing that. So yeah. our manager called us out on it too, and he's like, you all got to be on that level like you all need to be triple threats apparently <laughs> like, right. like and uh so we got like group lessons essentially absolutely and we started uh learning how to sing as a band and and uh you know communicate with each other and that and we would have warm-ups before the show of just like the whole band sitting there practicing our harmony parts and warming up together which was hugely beneficial for our live set because we could actually sing in tune we were warmed up uh, it's especially great for our lead singer because it kind of gave him like the excuse to do lip trills and stuff. He didn't have yeah. to do it on his own. We're doing it as a group, you know? Um, yeah. And then it, I think it brought us closer as like friends and stuff, you know? It was like this like thing we did. And we could do it while we're driving to the gig in the RV or whatever on tour. Yeah. It was awesome. Um, so if you're a band, I and I mean, everybody listening to this podcast is in a band. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, you should totally look into like group vocal lessons as well. I don't know if you even offer those, Matt, but it's it's definitely a oh really yeah. Cool thing. So that's that's actually some of the really fun stuff because you get to stretch from from a musical uh, theory perspective. You get to kind of stretch those muscles a little mm -hmm. bit more. Whereas with like solo singing, it's kind of like what's written on the page is kind of what you follow. 
But, you know, when you're working with a band, usually there's already a melody that's written, maybe not uh, a second or a third harmony. So that's that I actually absolutely love that stuff because I'm like, okay, so you're taking the root, you're taking the third, you're taking the fifth, then we all modulate to the two chord or whatever it happens to be. And sorry if that uh, sounds like gobbledygook to some of you guys out there. It's just what's going on in my brain. Um, But oftentimes when I'm working with someone, they just find it incredibly helpful to be like, oh, this that's your note. You start on that note and then you kind of figure everything else out and you have this beautiful, it's almost like a choir experience. You almost have this beautiful kind of choir experience of all of your voices blending together. And you're absolutely right. Like these days you have to be good. So everybody in the band has to be a singer too. You know, once you get to a certain level. Yeah, yeah, they should at least look like they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we turned down James's mic. Okay, yeah, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one's not meant to be on. <laughs> do, you, do you guys know that uh, the band, when they were recording The Last Waltz, mm-hmm. they all turned down... And so Robbie Robertson, you know, fantastic songwriter, not a good singer, <laughs> but he was surrounded by other good singers. Yep. And so in the first... The reason that they actually re-recorded every song on that album. I think they just kept Levon Helm's drums. Um, But they actually got rid of uh, Robbie's voice because he kept singing throughout the the recording Uh um, and they just had to strip his voice out completely. Uh, So yeah, (laughs) you should, you should all learn. Everyone should learn how to sing. (laughs) that's a i think that's actually a great way to end this episode like everyone should learn how to sing and um (laughs) yeah totally so thank you so much matt for taking the time and coming on um maybe you you do because you do a better job at this than i do maybe you could quickly sum up where people should go now because we mentioned so many different things maybe a quick summary of where we should send people would be awesome sure i think a great place to get started if if you're kind of new to the whole singing, the whole singing technique thing, um, just go to rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com. It'll, it's kind of a fun little tool, very little, very low barrier to entry. And it's kind of fun to do. So you just sing your lowest note. It turns on your microphone. Then you, uh, sing your highest note, turns on your microphone. You sing your highest note. It does not have to be perfect. Does not have to be pretty. We're just looking for some raw data about like what your range is. Mm -hmm. And then you can be like, huh, well, that note didn't sound very good. Maybe I should work on that. It gives you a a great place to get started. Cool. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you again. Uh, I'll definitely check out your YouTube channel first thing, and then maybe, maybe (laughs) I'll book a call. I'm really interested. I've I've never done that, so I'm really curious. (laughs) This would be the first time that I've booked one on air, so that's what I want, Benedict. I need need you to follow through with that right now. (laughs) <laughs> uh, no, it's it's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's really fun. Yeah, thank awesome. you, Matt. And uh, yeah, I, I told the intent to, to ask you on to my other podcast, uh, Your Band Sucks at Business, because like what you've done audience building wise, like I know Benny has just been itching to ask questions about that that weren't <laughs> relevant for this audience. So we're, we're going to have you back and be chatting <laughs> with you soon, I hope. <laughs> right on. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.